right, so let's uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, look at this at some stuff on um, religion and and uh, and ritual. Let me see if I can get my notes up here so I can actually see them. Um, I mean, we think of religion. There's a lot of things that kind of come to mind. Obviously, whoops, that's not supposed to be on the screen. The Puerto Rican, no, that's Brazil. That is Brazil. It's um, the uh, yeah, it's the uh, the statue of Christ Redeemer in Rio de Janeiro. So, okay. I mean, when we think of religions, we think of things like uh, important symbols, uh, the how the symbolic imagery and the meaning it it uh, carries tells us things about what religion is, what it means to people, what role it plays in society. Obviously, you know, with the Im- giant image of Christ looking over the whole city, very symbolic. Um, very symbolic picture there. Uh, then there are all there are other images, of course, from like other religions. We have you know Buddhist statues here. These gates, um, to, uh, tori, are what they're called. They're uh, on in front of any Shinto shrine you'll ever find. This one's actually from the top of Mount Fuji. Um, there's a shrine on the top of the mountain, and to the left of it, there's actually a post office, so you can mail things from Mount Fuji, which is kind of funny. Um, but we are, you know one of the, another one of the things we associate with religion. Uh, is are the the images the uh, the symbols that hold important meaning? There's also the actions, the the practices that people have as part of religion, and uh, this is always one of the things I found particularly interesting. The you know a rosary on the left hand side here, you know you pray the rosary, um, but also that uh, Buddhist prayer beads often look very similar, where you know, pray I pray as you count through them essentially. Uh, yeah, they usually the Buddhist ones have 108 beads. It comes from some story that I totally forget. Um, but there's 108 beads on it. I forget how. I don't know how many are on the rosary. Um, and it's also when we think of religion, we think of places. Uh, you know, a, a typical image of a kind of a, a this looks like a very New England church on the left here, um, with the steeple and the the uh, main hall where people. We'll go to meet and to, to worship, and then uh, on the left here is the uh, the National Mosque in Malaysia. So another um, kind of religious place, religious sites. So these are some of the things that we often um, think of when we think of what religion is, its role in society. But when we start to talk about religion anthropologically, uh, we have to start to look at a few important questions. Um, one of which being, of course, what is religion? Um, why do we need a concept of religion? Uh, what is it exactly that we're talking about? And at, to a certain extent, this seems like a rhetorical question. It's like if you ask what's religion, well, most people would be like, well, you know, the church down the street's religion, the person praying um, over their meal's religion. That, that it almost seems like it's a question that anyone would have an answer to, but when you really get down to um, kind of the nuts and bolts of any definition of religion, it becomes very hard to define. Uh, that religion's will be sl- slightly different in ways that make it hard to have one definition that encompasses everything. Um, and it also becomes difficult to kind of differentiate things. Where does religion stop and politics start? Where does religion stop and, uh, and something else start? You know, what's, ha- what's the difference between religion and culture? In some places, there is no difference. The religion encompasses almost all of the culture itself. Uh, in others, there seem to be some kind of separation. Um, but in trying to figure out which parts religion, which parts not, you have to have good definitions uh, to work with. But even saying that, it's important also to recognize the fact that when we talk about defining religion, and particularly in uh, a class like this, we're talking about defining it socially. Uh, we're not talking about defining it religiously. That a religious definition of, uh, of religion, of what religion is, uh, will be very different than what a social definition will be. Um, it'll, they'll focus on very different things. Social definitions are going to look more at what people um, do that's religious, um, why certain practices are the way they are, how those practices influence society as a whole. But social definitions of religion aren't really going to be uh, as concerned with content. You know, that the social social discussions of religion shouldn't shouldn't be. Sometimes they have been shouldn't be all that concerned with questions of you know, whether or not God exists. Uh, a, classic, a classic kind of sidestepping of that, um, of that issue for, for a social scientist is uh, this, um, this statement by a scholar where he, he mentions that uh, you know, uh, beliefs are 
beliefs are, are, are re, you know, the things that people believe in are real in the, in the extent to which people act on them. So it's like whether, you know, we, we don't even are, we're not really concerned about the question, at least sociologically or anthropologically, of whether or not, you know, God actually exists. Um, that's a religious discussion. Um, it's not a sociological one. What we're concerned about is what do people do when they believe that he does? That's more of what we're concerned with. So it's how you act out your beliefs. Exactly, it's exactly. Kind of a sociological and, and this is an important question less uh, because there have been scholars that have been very fixated on this question. You know, trying to explain religion, um, not not what religious people do or what religious organizations theology, do. Yeah, they they've tried to explain at times uh, why religion exists uh, from very social, uh, eh, not only social but social, psychological, historical. Uh, so, like taking lenses. the spiritual part out of it. Exactly. It's a, why people need that or do it. Yeah, exactly. So kind of assuming uh, what we call a priori. So it's like before before considering anything else, assuming that that what religion is talking about is is incorrect, that the content is is not true, and then trying to come up with an explanation for why it would exist. Examples of this would be things like uh, uh, kind of evolutionary uh, historical evolutionary conceptions of religion where. You know, people people looked at you know on their on their world couldn't answer a lot of big questions about like why are we here why is the world the way it is why do people live and die and therefore populate the world with gods to explain all the mystery out there and then as you go through history those many gods kind of cycle down to a few. Um, that's been that's one way that people try to explain it. Uh, Freud thought that religion was kind of a product of. Um, certain psychological experiences that we had and uh, one of the people we even talked about or you actually read him I didn't have you read the part of it but um, what Durkheim's explanation for it was that yeah religion is real because people are responding to something greater than themselves but that thing that they're responding to is society so the thing that makes that makes people believe that there's something beyond themselves is society itself so that therefore it's like society creates um, people's belief in God. But any of those considerations are not the, that's not what religion should be concerned with. Or it's not what uh, so, social scientific studies of religion should be concerned with. That it's kind of, those are religious questions. We leave that to the theologians. We leave that to the religious studies people. It's not our, it's not our, um, our role here. More of what we want to get at is the question of um, what is religion itself analytically so that when we go and try to study society, we can kind of pull it out and say, like, this thing, religion, creates these different outcomes, or it does it does certain things socially that we think are important. Well, aside from all that, just something, um, I can't think of the right fancy word, but anyway, people say, like, that you do things religiously, mm -hmm. which is kind of taken probably from people who consistently... Um, are dedicated to practicing a yeah. certain thing. So when you do something religiously, it means that, you know, like you never miss, you feel obligated, you do it mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Exactly. It's, you know, there's some kind of like ritual aspect to it. So no, that's a very good point. Society has kind of taken a, um, a, a off shoot from... Yeah, no, that's a good point. And that's, we'll, we'll see this to be true as we get into some of these definitions, that there are aspects of what we define as religion that actually bleed into other things, that they're... Depending on how you define religion um, and what religion does, you, you can find a lot of other things kind of fitting that mold. Um, so let's go ahead and consider some of these uh, some of these definitions. So uh, Durkheim's this was in uh, this was in the reading this week. Um, it was kind of like the very end of the first section that I assigned from um, from the Durkheim book. Uh, Durkheim, in trying to trying to create a definition of religion, most people before him had obviously looked at things like supernatural beliefs, you know, the belief in God, um, you know, participation in a church. Durkheim did something a little bit different. He he introduces a couple things that um, that changed the way we understood definitions of religion. And and though his definition itself didn't quite get us there, it kind of set social scientific understandings of religion on a very new course. So. One of the things is he, he, instead of talking about the supernatural, instead of talking about God as an important part of the definition, 
he discuss he brings in this idea of sacred things. Um, that the, he brings in this idea of there being the sacred, there being um, what he calls the profane, and he creates this distinction. Um, so it's like the normal things of life and the things that are somehow uh, considered uh, beyond the norm, like something with uh, a power or an importance that's not um, the same as the normal everyday things that we do or see or take part in. Uh, and he anchors it there. So the sacred things and the practices that are, uh, that are um, part of um, what makes them sacred part of the community that binds, uh, that is bound up together around those sacred things. So if we look at his definition here, there's a few things that are important, um, a few things that we want to consider. So he talks about it being a unified system of beliefs and practices. So this, this being the idea that, and here he's probably thinking of trying to distinguish religion um, from things like magic. You know, magic aren't, doesn't necessarily um, fit into this idea of like a unified system of beliefs. It's kind of, it's very, uh, what you, would you call it? It can be a little bit more creative, more random. It's, you kind of just do things to create certain outcomes. There's not really a, a system that holds it all together. Uh, he, uh, then, of course, this important concept of sacred things, and he talks about this as being like things that are set apart and that involve prohibition. So, like you can't touch them. You can't. Uh, with the ones he talks about, it's it's often like you can't. If you're part of a, a tribe whose signal animal is, um, you know, whatever, 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 like, like the wall. Yeah, they don't eat. Yeah, it's like, yeah, exactly. So, the, yeah, exa that's a great example. Yeah, so cows are sacred um, for uh, Hindu practitioners, so no one ever, uh, I mean, not only do they not eat them, but they don't even, like, touch them, but they'll kind of do whatever they, they do want. They do. <laughs> and then, of course, there's a mention of beliefs and practices, but the, the main thing for Durkheim here was that all of this, he says, unites it, its adherence to a single moral community. So for Durkheim, the important thing was that religious practices around sacred, uh, sacred things, be they objects, be they, <coughs> things, uh, be they symbols, binds the community together as a moral community. Um, and often it's the sacred and profaneness that defines what is moral and immoral. So Durkheim here, the, the things we get out of him are the moral community, the sacred things, the importance of, um, of the system of practices and beliefs. But this isn't the only way to define religion. There's a lot of other ways to do so and a lot of ways that this has been done. Um, a few of these different authors, Tillich, Greeley, Bella, um, early Bella, later Bella, he goes kind of in a totally different direction, point out that religion is also about uh, big questions or what, um, or, uh, what uh, Tillich calls like ultimate concerns. You know, that this would be things like you know, death or life's meaning and purpose or, or things of that kind. These, these kind of questions where regardless of what scientific knowledge you have, it really doesn't get at the, it really ever gets at the heart um, that there are these ultimate concerns that people have and religion is often centered around those concerns, trying to explain them, trying to account for them. That's why they often have creation stories. Where do we come from? They have uh, stories about what a, a group of people's purpose is. You know? So if you think of things like the Great Commission, it gives a purpose to the church. If you think of um, older uh, Certain older myths they give they give kind of a preeminence to like a certain you know racial or ethnic group that their purpose is to kind of carry forward the the teaching they've been they've been hand, uh, that has been handed down to them. Um, this is what Greeley talks about this idea of like a of universal man that you know as as secular to a certain extent that uh, that society may have be, may be becoming. There's a sense in which you know uh, the way he puts it is humanity hasn't really changed since the Stone Age that. Our concerns are the same thing. You know, where am I going when I die? Why am I here in the first place? That these are questions that um, never really, never really change. This makes sense so far. We good? Stop me if anything is is sounds um, screwy. Um, there are a few later ones that uh, try to bring a few of these things together. So, um, because with Durkheim's with Durkheim's definition, if you have sacred things, those things don't necessarily have to be supernatural. It could be a rock that you think is important, but like you know, that doesn't make it um, that doesn't make it supernatural. Or other things like uh, you could say to a certain extent, like flags for large portions of um, national populations are sacred things. That's why there's always so much conflict about the idea of like, can you burn the American flag? 
there's certain rituals or some ways you're supposed to dispose of them. Yeah, it's like, exactly. Which is, but it also ties to this idea that when people light a flag on fire, then, you know, no one really attributes supernatural power to a flag, but if you light one on fire, you're going to make a lot of people angry. Um, because to them, there's a sacred quality to it. So sacredness doesn't necessarily <coughs> mean supernatural power. Is, is that the definition of sacred when you say that, that if you, I forget, but if, when you say that if they burn the flag, which is a piece of material, mm -hmm. instead of talking about sacred religious things, or you just don't, you're not talking about it at all. Well, I'm saying with, with Durkheim's definition of just sacred things, it can extend to those those things. Certainly within religion, there are many things that are sacred. That's certainly true. Um, but the I, the concept of sacredness, it doesn't only apply to... Well, it doesn't only apply to supernatural things. Durkheim would say that it only applies to, to religious things. So for him, he would say that, you know, flags for... Um, for people have a religious quality to them. Yeah, right. um, but I mean, that's kind of like up for debate. Some later definitions have kind of gone back to this idea that you really can't get rid of the idea of supernaturality. That the supernatural has to be a part of our definition of religion because it's really the thing that sets apart religion from other things. So why is religion different than nationalism? Well, nationalism isn't talking about the supernatural, whereas religion is. They both have sacred things. They both have rituals. But only religion talks about something supernatural. Uh, Riesbord has a great definition here where he talks about you know, a complex of practices. So it's, it's not just that people hold beliefs, but that there are things that people do um, that are related to them based on the premise of the existence of superhuman powers, is what he calls it. Um, and there's a few things here. These are kind of technical, but I love them because this is a really smart way of putting this. So it's not even based on the existence of superhuman things, or based on the belief in superhuman things, but based simply on the premise. So what this means is that um, it's still religious if someone doesn't, uh, what would be a great example of this? It's still, if someone goes to a church and they don't, on Christmas, and, actually, and other than going to church on Christmas, have no affiliation to Christianity, uh, Riesbrot would still call that a religious act, because it's still based on the premise of that existence. That the, that the practice itself came from this belief in superhuman powers. Whether people maintain it or not is almost irrelevant. Uh, that, that, that it's still religious because it's based on that idea, that concept, whether individuals themselves hold it or not. That makes sense, kind of? Well, it seems like it's still, it's like, I mean, the man went to church, he didn't believe in it, but he went because it's a, it's a ritual that they do concerning mm -hmm. a sacred thing, so he just doesn't make him a religious person, he just did a religious thing. Yeah. Well, to a certain extent, it would make him a religious person, but it wouldn't make, um, it, it means nothing about his own personal beliefs, that he's participating in something called religion. Uh, and then the other thing that, it, that, that uh, is separated here is that often discussions of superhuman powers get caught up in this idea of there has to be a god in the whole thing. Well, not a religion has god. Question? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But how can a man be religious if he doesn't really want god just because he went to church? Well, they have a lot of sayings now that say, like, just because you go to McDonald's, it doesn't make you a cheeseburger or whatever. You know, just because you. Well, this is, cause this is a good question. So it's. If you do an act, it doesn't mean that you. That's not the same. That's not the same. Because it's more than cheeseburgers. There's a little nugget things, and it's all a bunch of stuff. So if you're at McDonald's, you got a whole big choice. If you're at the church. Choice what? is religion. Well, then you well you also have a whole lot of choices. I mean, the choice that you went to church. I'm not talking about the different choices of religion. I'm talking about the choice that you went to. No, I mean even at church. So going to church is a different thing than believing in what the church is talking about, which is a different thing than praying, which is a different thing than worshiping. But I'm not talking about it. I was talking about a person, he's just sitting up there. He doesn't have a belief, he doesn't have a choice. He just went because somebody told him to go and that would maybe make somebody happy. Well this is also so this is this is um that's more of a cultural thing because they're and I like say well, 
their uh, nephew's dedication or baptism or something like that. And he may never go to church, but he goes for that because it's a family function. Mm-hmm. Well, this this is uh, no, I, I know what you mean. So the the problem the problem that we're running into here is is uh, again this is a problem of definitions. So what makes what is religion? What makes someone religious? Uh, that there's a number of ways that you could define it. If you if you are <coughs> defining it merely by um, practice, then what's in the person's head doesn't matter at all. If they show up, they count. Uh, if you define it by belief, then asking them questions about what they believe is what matters. It, whether they show up or not doesn't matter at all. So it's it's what angle you take on this. And then there's there's self identification. Do you call yourself one? Like there are people who are Hindu or who are Hindi who would call themselves that, but might not believe in any of it, might not practice anything, but they self identify. So there's a number of different angles that you can use to define it. So even saying that someone's a religious person is a very slippery... I mean, again, it means something different from in religious studies than it does sociologically. So if I say someone... Is, like, I wouldn't use the term that they're a religious person because that, that implies a continuity that we would say is an empirical question. Well, I need to keep track and see whether long-term he remains a religious... You know, if he remain, continues doing religious things... Uh, does that does that kind of make well, sense? It's kind of, it's so together. it's coming together because they say in Hollywood most of the people say they're religious or they're Christian. Yeah. So this this is more um, so with a definition like this, the the thing to notice here is that it's not talking about the individual people. It's talking about the religion. So you would say that uh, if someone you know goes to a church service that they're participating in religion, but religion is defined as as something um, kind of on its own. Uh, that people participate in, they do a number of things, but it's not, they're, not, uh, they're not really participating as a religious person. They're there to participate in a setting. Well, it, it just raises the question that as you know, so again, sociologically, whether religious person is even yes, is even useful as a term. Uh, okay. Yeah. But no, but that's a very good question because that that actually got that gets directly at how these different ways of defining it change the way that you measure things. So I, um, I actually worked with, um, I was working with this guy who, uh, they did a study in China. So if you could, if you could break down the different aspects of religion. So um, there's self-ID, so self-identification, that if you were to ask me what religion, like what religion do you belong to, that I have an answer. So self-ID. Then there's beliefs. So it's like, do you believe in God? Do you believe in at the afterlife? Do you believe in etc.? Um, practices. Do you pray? Do you have you know a um, a family shrine in your house that you that you you know keep up? Do you go to you know the family tomb for tomb for um, grave sweeping day? You know, do you practice? And there's attendance. Um, many, not most, uh, or not, some religions, not all, have um, kind of a, a sense of regular attendance. This one's problematic because this is a very like Western Christian concept of religion. Like Buddhists and Shintos, like they don't have like attendance doesn't matter. There's nothing that you attend. Like you you take part in festivals, you take part in certain um, big rituals, but like you don't like you don't go to your temple every week. That just doesn't make any sense to them. Um, so breaking down these four different aspects of religion, uh, they did a study, uh, they did this uh, survey in China and found that um, none of these things ma- matched up properly. So you had people who would self-ID, so you'd have people who would call themselves like uh, Buddhists, but actually didn't believe that Buddha existed. Or you'd have people that believed that Buddha existed, but wouldn't call themselves Buddhists, even though they prayed and went to temples. Um, and you have people who would attend church but not and not believe and not self ID as being Christians. So you would have like these very I mean, of course you had some where everything matched up, but you also had tons of them where things didn't match up as you would ex- uh, as you would expect. Like they were kind of like all over the place. Um, and that, it was a very interesting finding. And that what you put up there, those four different things. Uh huh. I can say this. 
I'm trying to sound stupid. But in church, the person already identified himself. Uh-huh. He already believed, but he don't practice. Yeah, but again, this is one of the important differences here is that uh, the concept of like a religious person for churches is very different than what we're talking about here. Because with with churches, you know, saying that someone's a religious person has um, has like eternal consequence. Yeah. Whereas for sociologists, all it means is like all we're looking for is you know how do our statistics line up? How do we measure things? How do we explain certain social processes? So um, you're uh, you're right, but it's a different context. Uh, and how come I'm getting so close to it? Why do I? I mean, because of course the two are in conversation, yeah. um, but they're they're not exactly the same thing. Right, right. And they're talking they're talking about similar things, but not in the same way, and not for the same reason. Right, right, right. And when a pastor when a pastor's thinking about religious people and, and believers and practitioners, yeah. they're thinking of it in terms of like of. Um, you know the the congregant's relationship to the God that the pastor believes in is trying to lead them towards. Uh, you know the same thing for like a Buddhist or a, Sh a Shinto priest. They're thinking of of the people attending as um, as vital parts of this religious spiritual community that they're trying to maintain in service. When you're looking at a, an anthropologist, the anthropologist is looking at it's like what are people doing and what does it mean. So that's what we're that's more of what we're concerned with here. Uh, yeah, which is why again, like, don't assume that anything that anthropologists say have has uh, too much implica too many implications for like theology because there it's yeah. it's different it's different people talking about different things. Yeah, so uh, I read some stuff that was really weird in that paper. Yeah, a few of them. Oh, especially yeah, if it was the photocopies from the Durkheim. Yeah, yeah Durkheim yeah. says some very interesting stuff. Um, but again, he's he's primarily thinking about how do I measure this thing this. Uh, this social fact that people participate in something that we call religion and that I need to figure out a way to, to think about it so that I, I can understand how to not only explain what people do that is religious but how what they do that as, as participating in religion how that affects everything else that they do. And that's why it takes somebody to really understand these things because so many people are you know, often a weird thing mm -hmm. And do some weird stuff with lack of understanding. Yes. Even in what they believe in, like, like somebody might I I read with uh, what's that man's name? That's the summer I'm told where the people were were saying they were casting out demons out of their baby, and he killed them both because they were saying that the demon was in the baby and their religion, whatever it was, it wasn't of a sound foundation, and it, they they just. And he walked in and he said, "We just killed your baby." So it's not really, uh, it's not really funny when people get into some of the things that have weird uh, things that they have to do to be in it. Mm. Maybe people just make up stuff to do, like the musical things, the witchcraft, and the sorcery things that people do yeah. to, to draw people in, like they said Jim Jones did. Those people. And, he killed a lot of people from believing that they really was following God. Yeah, but again, like those the, those content questions, it was like the question about like which religion is right. That's a totally different topic. It's a totally different like we leave that to the religious studies people. We're no, we're dealing with, with something something totally different. The ecclesiastes gets used to what we're brought up with and what we're trained in, mm -hmm. and um, then. You know, we, you'd be like amazed that you could probably just talk to a hundred people and get a hundred different ideas. And we're so used to our group of people believing mm -hmm. the same thing yeah. that it, it can be really difficult. And then, yeah, you start going, wow, that's way out there, and that's way out there, and how did it get to that extreme? And, and that's a, a is that is big what question. Can I answer it? Is that what we're saying? Sociology does. Why do people do that? Uh, somewhat. It's also yeah. It's trying to look at kind of like the commonalities between them. So it's not just how do I analyze a single religion, but how do we analyze this phenomenon that we call religion? What people need. 
mean, it's like, so what, what is it? I mean, and this is basically what these definitions are trying to do. It's like when you look at Buddhism, Shinto, um, Christianity, uh, Islam, like what, what are the things that kind of tie all of this together? Socially. Because I mean, obviously once you get into like the theologies, like the, the things will become very different. But socially, what ties all of this together? Um, and I actually like uh, Riza Brot's definition um, and particularly since, because he gets down to this idea that at basis, what religion is about is this idea of a uh, what he calls a promise of salvation. That it's about kind of navigating this uh, the, this relationship with superhuman powers um, because of this uh, this need for salvation, uh, be it purely spiritual, mostly spiritual, purely material, uh, what have you. Uh, but that's kind of what the um, what the focus what the focus is. Um, yeah, it's uh, recognizing this this fact that it's these um, that the superhuman powers and, and religion itself actually has the ability to control the means of salvation. But they have some relationship that um, by which they're able to uh, influence the, the means of salvation, um, which is why they they have so much um, power and importance in human society because. To be honest, like the things that we think of as falling under this idea of a promise of salvation, are kind of the most important aspects of kind of human human life and experience. Uh, be they the material things, you know, there are some religions that are very material. It's like I worship this god because I believe that my crops will be more bountiful, um, or it's I worship this god because when I die, that whole problem will be solved. The whole problem of death and where where I will be and what I'll be doing will be solved which are some of the largest questions um, in human life and experience. Um, but Reese Brooks' definition is still a bit more kind of like, uh, not cognitive, that's not quite the right word, but it's a little bit more um, abstract. It's still talking about these larger beliefs, these, uh, um, even when we say that religion is about a, the promise of salvation, that's really indistinct. It's not really telling us too much. Um, another helpful way of, of getting at this and we both we read the Geertz and um, Howell and Paris both uh, also refer to him quite a bit. Is the Geertz Geertz focuses in on this idea of religion? Um, Ooh, where the rest? Oh no, this is good. Uh, religion as um, as what it calls it. It's a, as a cultural system, and what he means by this is is that for certain. Groups where religion has a, uh, where religious <coughs> importance is still rather uh, extreme or essential, uh, so where where religion has has kind of a central influence on the the shape of the culture and what people do, that it's in those contexts where religion itself actually forms almost the totality of the cultural system. So, what people believe, the worldviews that they have, the things that they think and do, are shaped by their religious beliefs and commitments. And so we see here that Geertz has a few aspects to his definition. So he calls, he calls religion um, a system of symbols. Um, so it's, uh, it's these meaningful symbols uh, that, that are kind of at, at the center of this. Um, which is interesting, because again, remember that a few of these that we've looked at have either been focusing on the beliefs or the practices. And for Geertz, it's actually the symbols of him themselves. So it's the meaning that things have. Um, it, uh, that are that are part of religion, um, and it talks about that the help establish these moods and motivations, so that it's not just that there are symbols, but they're symbols that actually cause people to do things. Um, they they establish the what he calls moods and motivations, um, and that are related to uh, beliefs about the general order and existence of things. Um, that it's that these are it's not just. Uh, you know, random symbols that influence moods and motivations, but it's ones that are specifically linked to what we think the world is like, what we think life is actually like and about. Um, and it's that it's that that, he's, that for Geertz um, is at the heart of what religion is. So this also we see here with like this general order of existence. This is somewhere seemingly between the. Um, the Durkheimian definition and then kind of reason for talk of like superhuman powers, it's much more closer. This looks very similar to the idea of like ultimate concerns. Um, that it's talking about what things are ultimately like um, and how, and for Geertz, again, the definition is how that 
uh, is put into symbols and how those symbols actually shape what people do. Uh, one other definition that we can talk about for a little bit here uh, is one by, um, uh, it's actually the same guy who did the study uh, and found that this mess of, of how self-identification beliefs, practices, and attendance all fit together. Um, and if we look at the, I'm not going to spend too much time on, on this part here, but for, uh, for Professor Young, he actually kind of melds together a few of these different definitions if you look at it closely. It looks basically like Geertz mixed with, um, with Durkheim. Uh, the important thing we're going to look at a chart in just a sec is uh, he, rec he pulls out a few what he calls like essential aspects of religion. One is belief in the supernatural, um, a set of beliefs regard regarding life in the world. So this is more like Geertz. It's like what the general order is. Um, a set of ritual practices manifesting those beliefs. So it's the beliefs then take some kind of form of like regular practice, regular ritual. Um, and then a distinct or social organization or moral community. So it's, it's that it's not just that people are doing this on their own, but it's actually communities that are linked together um, by these actions, by these beliefs. So we see this is very Durkheim. Um, this is uh, quite a few of them, very Geertzian. Um, but also recognizing the importance of beliefs in the supernatural. So this definition kind of nicely <laughs> brings them together, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, if I'm going too quick, let me know. How are we doing? I think we'll take a break at 7.30. Good. Okay. And uh, this this chart here, the thing that's nice about this um, this chart is that one of the problems with the definition <coughs> of the so far is that there's kind of an either or. It's like either you, it's religion or it's not religion. Uh, but here we we get more of a sense that we can kind of break that down. That there are other ways of thinking of religion. So. Um, the, the categories here is full religion, where each of those four things that we mentioned in the last slide are all present. Um, a semi-religion, where all four of them are present, but the beliefs in the organization are somehow undeveloped. They're not, they're not full formed yet. Um, Quasi-religion, where uh, there's most of these things are present, but the, the organization really isn't uh, cohesive. It's more kind of like broken down and spread out. And then pseudo-religion, where it looks like religion, but at the center of it isn't actually a belief in the supernatural, that, that it, it performs like a religion, but doesn't actually have the supernatural beliefs. And this is a really useful chart for, um, for understanding this. So if we think of full religions, and you have some examples here. You know, if we think of full religions, you know, we have a few of the classics, you know, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, things that anyone would recognize as a religion. There are beliefs in the supernatural, um, there are, are beliefs about what, um, how life should be ordered. Um, there are specific ritual practices, and there are identifiable organizations. Obviously, with uh, Christianity, it's churches and denominations. Buddhism, there are temples, and there are even like whole sects. Um, so, if you think of things like Zen Buddhism, where you know, it's a organizationally linked together. Um, Islam, um, similar thing, mosques, uh, and a uh, whole kind of like, uh, you know, the Sunni Muslims, um, I forget what the other group is, Sufi, uh, I can't remember. Uh, but this is different than the... Judaism. Judaism would fall under, would be a full religion, um, by this definition, because all of these things would fit. Semi-religions, though, uh, all these things are here, but there's a sense in which they're underdeveloped. So... The examples he has here are like folk or popular religions, magic, I don't know if I would include it that far up, uh, or spirituality. Hi. Hi. Welcome, welcome. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Good right. Lord. You got a teenage daughter that's sick. I don't know where I'm supposed to sit. Anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you got a slide in here. Sorry. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With semi-religions, uh, 
An interesting one for this chart would actually be Shintoism, because there's parts of Shinto that would fall under a full religion. So state Shinto would be a full one. Uh, Shintoism generally would probably be a semi-religion, because it's so more local. Some of like the New Age things, uh, like... A lot of the New Agey stuff would probably be semi-religion. So this is why, it, this is what, that's probably what he means by the concept of like spiritualities. It's that, that like... The people and... Yeah, it's like that we're not quite sure, like they think something's out there um, and there are things you're supposed to do, like maybe like you know, meditation or, um, or, or seances. But, you know, there, there's less of a sense of how that actually folds out in the rest of, you know, life. Um, and there aren't really like fully developed organizations. Some have them. So things like Wiccans. <coughs> um, <coughs> Wiccans are probably something where it was... Uh, uh, quasi-religion that's moved up the charts, essentially. Uh, that they, that it's, it now has a, you know, a developed organizational structure and is developing beliefs about like what the general order of life should be like. Um, Quasi-religions is where a lot of these different aspects are present, but there's no real organization that binds them all together. Or it's maybe not discernibly so. We'll talk about civil religion a little bit more later, but a few of these other ones are really good. So, do any of you know what um, ancestor worship is? Ancestor worship is very typical of um, Eastern religions. So the belief being that, um, or the practice being that when you, uh, houses would actually keep shrines to any of their like dead ancestors or parents and that one, one, a person's, um, part of a person's obligation as a child or as a member of a household would be to um, continue to like, uh, like to offer things to one's ancestors. Ancestor worship gets a little weird because there's really no organization. It's just that every household does this. Um, but there's no organization that goes through and like checks. It's like, oh, where's your, you know, where's your, your ancestor shrine? Um, there's no like meeting of like ancestor, like local ancestor worship. So it's not not part of it. The problem with it is that the thing that makes it a little weird here is that it also fits with some of these other ones. So that um, ancestor worship and Buddhism go together quite well. Most Buddhists uh, Buddhists are ancestor. Well, many Buddhists are ancestor worshippers. That um, they aren't. They, they have other things that make it a full religion. Yeah, or it's usually. It's usually kind of like latched on to four religions, but it, 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 it in and of itself is not. Because again, like this, the organization of it is very diffuse. It's just people do this. Um, like my uh, kid's grandmother, it's kind of odd. She has pictures all over her walls, but she like when someone dies, then she specifically has one wall with every dead person that she could get a picture of on that in that one place. Yeah. And often I don't think um, she worships it or offers it anything, but it's like a shrine, kind of like a yeah. These these there would be so the Japanese ones. They there would be a shrine that you could open up, and there would be um, a picture of of whatever deceased people you would have there. Or if it's not that, it'd be a tablet, uh, like a stone tablet that would be set in the middle, and there would usually be plates that you would put food on. So things like. A typical offering would be like an orange or, or um, like moon cakes or things like that. And then there's um, a, a clay pot in the middle with sand in it that you would put incense in. Uh, and Japanese ones, or no, the, the incense pots are more Chinese. The Japanese ones would usually have a steel bowl with a little like metal knocker that you would um, smack the bowl with. It like to get it would like resonate, kind of like a, a tuning fork. So you would smack it and then you would pray. Um, so you know, they actually like pray to the, the, their ancestors. Uh, the thing is, with ancestor worship, it's often here that things are a little... Um, or it's for quasi-religions, it's not only is the organization diffused, but I would also note that um, the supernatural part usually borrows heavily from something else. So if we think of when we talk about it later, civil religion in most cases borrows very heavily from Christianity. Ancestor worship borrows very heavily from Confucianism, Taoism, Shinto, Buddhism. Um, guild cults being very similar, that they often they often borrow very heavily from folk religions or popular religions. Um, what are guild cults? 
Guild cults would usually be things like, uh, what, do you guys know what guilds are? Like, like a group of people or something? Or that like do. Or something like that. Not quite. So they're, oh, they were yeah, a pre-modern, exactly. they were a group of people, but they, the, the purpose would be for um, occupations. So guilds are kind of occupational associations mm -hmm. where older experts would um, train apprentices, but also that um, it's kind of like the precursor of unions in a certain way, where guilds would also, it's like everyone who was a stonemason in a certain city would be part of the, a stonemason's guild. You guys know stonemasons? They like do like. See, I just think we're going to represent the lollipop guild. <laughs> you represent the lollipop guild. Yeah, so, so they would all be lollipop makers <laughs> in, in that guild. But they would also set things like. Um, Standard standard weights and measures for the for the profession, standard prices. They would negotiate in certain ways so that medical associations. Uh, medical associations are kind of an outcome. Yeah. So there are like um, professional groups that we kind of have to go by their rules, or if yeah. you're part of that group to be licensed, or you have to. Yeah, but guilds guilds mostly die out with the. Um, Guilds in this way, you, there certainly are still professional associations, and obviously unions are two, you know, two kind of. Don't worship themselves. I'm sorry. I hope, I hope this is still the right thing. When you be in India, the monkeys and things don't on top of those buildings and stuff. Well, they can't do nothing with them. They don't. They 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 they, they worship them. So the monkeys and all of them. They were doing stuff like throwing their pee in the face of mm -hmm. And they'd be all up on top of buildings. But I'm thinking that these animals have now, since they're animals, they have sensed that they, nobody they can't do them. nothing to them. So they would, you know what I'm saying? They would, I, don't know I think so. <laughs> they, would, they would change the order of your living. I mean, people that. Well, uh, yeah, and the thing with that is probably, it's a similar thing with the cows, is that one reason that Hinduism is very um, respectful of any kind of living creature is, well, it's, uh, the, it is a strong belief in reincarnation, so it's that one's karma dictates where one ends up in one's next life, so you don't go like treating the monkeys badly because like the monkey could be like your, your, your yeah, it's like your great aunt or something like that. But I'm saying, doesn't it change, I guess I don't know why I'm thinking that. Doesn't it change the atmosphere of the social uh, standards in that place? Because you got the nasty monkeys. <laughs> yes, but I mean, I, I'm assuming that for they most places, monkeys nasty. don't play that huge of a role. I saw it on the television. They showed them where they were getting just completely wild. A whole bunch of them. was Mike, they was um, having babies. It was just 20 of them. India well, was, was maybe a little uh, it was different because my experience was going to Kenya. You'd be driving down the road and you'd see monkeys on the side of the road, ever. but it's a more like seeing a stray cat around here or a rabbit. Oh, really? Where yeah. you know you just see bunnies hopping around. No one really owns them. They're just oh, out. A big monkey. Oh, I'm talking about no. You, you, you're serious. I'm so, I mean, just yeah, in Kenya, they're not like worshipped or revered or anything. But they, people don't, in general, bother them. Oh, okay. They, so it's a places, different. Yeah. Places, India and Kenya. Yeah, that's why I said it. Yeah, I'm still failing to understand why the monkeys are going wild. Or no, I understand why they're going wild, but why, why, are, why monkeys? What are we doing with monkeys? Well, because I'm saying that since they they worship animals, mm -hmm. this makes a difference in their standards of living because they got the nasty monkeys walking around. Mm -hmm. These are human beings, even though they're Indian, mm -hmm. India. So. People coming from another country comes into this atmosphere. This whole atmosphere is a different living. Um, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Let me take my medicine. <laughs> <laughs> sugar medicine. Which, where well, I'm just saying, saying is well, what that where we see. Well, like for instance, if we have like, too many of something getting in our way, oh, like oh, at oh, um, Potato Creek, they Russian have a deer kill when the deer yeah. population oh, gets too big. So it doesn't take over our community. I think I see what you're saying, where they don't control any of that, and so yeah, the, the yeah. filth and the thing <coughs> of them living amongst people 
is a different environment. But, but yeah, but I mean, but this would this would this I mean that would be something that you would recognize under like so for Hinduism there are certain beliefs about the order of the world oh, that sorry. yeah you're right that like it would have certain it does I don't know like social but like environmental uh, <coughs> implications so like yes if you don't you know if you don't control the monkey population then it because you you see them as being somehow sacred then yes there will be lots of them moving around right um, that's certainly true. Uh, last thing on the guild cults is that so these guilds would often have like very strong religious aspects to them um, and have kind of like representative deities. So it's kind of like with uh, Catholicism where like basically anything you can do has probably as a saint that's you know patron saint of it. Uh, guild cults were similar where there was some kind of you know localized deity that was a, like tied to that kind of guild. You know, so if you were if you were metal workers, it was probably some kind of you know supernatural creature that had a really big hammer or something like that. Um, so the guild cults uh, were were kind of religious practices that were linked to um, linked to the work that mem the members of the guild did. Uh, but they were small groups. Uh, usually they were small groups. They were usually local to any given city. Uh, the the things that they worship might be common amongst them. So like, uh, you know, stonemasons all throughout Germany might have the same kind of thing that it worships, but there wasn't like a, um, you know, stonemason deity church that kind of formed a larger structure. It was just kind of things that people did as being part of the guild, but it had no larger, it had less of, a, of that like larger significance that you usually find with a full religion, um, where they're much more structurally like established. Things like knocking on wood for good luck or stuff like that comes from? That would, um, 